Thank you so much for being here. Hello. Hi, everyone. So to start off, you recorded your new EP, Groovy People, on a tour bus. As having your own studio on a bus is kind of like something out of Pimp My Ride, could you talk about what it was like having such a jealousy-inducing setup? Um, that's actually not true. Not true? I wish that was true. We recorded uh, a few songs on the bus, but uh, the Groovy People EP was made at this studio called Paramount in LA. But we did have, it wasn't like a plush pimp my ride sort of situation. It was like duct tape everywhere. And, you know. Slightly more janky than a, a jealousy inducing pimp my ride. Yeah, not quite, no. So to go back to the beginning of your career then, I believe uh, you started sort of by doing a, a slam poetry um, competition and being a part of that. Could you talk about how that sort of influenced your songwriting as you got into that? Um, yeah. I, uh, when I was maybe like in seventh grade, I just kind of wanted, I was like an angsty little kid and I wanted to express myself. And that I had like this teacher named Miss Juarez. Hi, Miss Juarez. Um, and she would, we would have like poetry slams in class and she just really encouraged me. And so I started going to poetry slams in San Francisco and just kind of being part of that scene. That was like when poetry slams were cool. I think they're becoming cool again. People, it's they're important, yeah, it's cyclical. But uh, so I was doing that, and then I did one in high school one day uh, at my school, and some kids that were in a band were like, yo, can you just do that over, they were like in jazz band, like over our music, and uh, I just went for it, and then I tried, and I always could, uh, I had a good ear uh, for melody, and like when it came time to write the hook on a song or whatever, I was always kind of natural at that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that was the very, very beginning. You said that at a certain point that music started taking over your life so much so that your friends would even start teasing you because you'd be playing basketball and singing along while you were doing that. Uh, could you talk about what it was like to sort of have music take over your brain like that? Yeah, I think um, anytime you're passionate about anything, um, it starts to consume you. And I kind of, I'm obsessive about one thing in my life at a time. And when I was a little kid, it was like basketball or whatever. Ball for Life 55 was my AOL uh, <laughs> handle. That's so, a good screen name. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> my, my best friends was Big Pimp Baseball. <laughs> uh, shout out uh, Sam Ritzenberg. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I just, once I uh, got that feeling of like being able to be on stage and sing some, something that you wrote and have people appreciate it, I mean, there's nothing better. So I just really, um, I started thinking about it all the time. and you know, songs and ideas and phrases and melodies are always running through my head, so. I think your first um, real big professional break as a, as a songwriter. Have I had a professional break? <laughs> <laughs> you're on the road, you're on the path, nice. rocket ship. But uh, your first kind of big professional break was when the producer, Nick Knack, invited you to sort of throw a mattress in the corner of his house and start songwriting with him. Uh, could you talk about what that was like and making go for it early on? Yeah, Nick Knack's the only person uh, in, in my like small group of friends, but I'm sure it's gonna grow, who still has his uh, AOL uh, email. You guys should all hit him up. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> nickbalding at AOL.com. <laughs> a lot of AOL plugs, this is the yeah. place. No, I'm into it. Uh, no, really, I didn't know what I was about to do. I had uh, broken up with my band, and I had moved uh, back to LA from New York, and Nick was like, man, just uh, throw your mattress in the corner, and like whoever comes in, just write. And uh, like Sean Kingston came through the first day. So we started working on his album. And then that led to like some Chris Brown stuff and um, started working with Pia Mia. And then it just kind of opened everything back up for me. So we still have the same studio, still rocking. So it's cool. Was it a bit of a struggle just jumping in so early? If Sean Kingston came on the first day, what was it like trying to write, which is kind of an internal thing and also Yo, kind of crowd please? No, being a a songwriter in LA trying to like get placements is the most grueling thing in the world because you write a hundred songs and they pick like one or two of them and there's the artist is just sitting there like right like go make some good and then you're like me look good. Ah. and then you know he'll just kind of come in and pick it apart or whatever but um, it was really good training because when you're uh, writing for other people and there's a lot of people writing for one person you want to make sure whatever you're saying has an impact and uh, is like effective musically, lyrically. So it taught me a lot. Um, and it's a blessing to be able to like use that for my own career now instead of for Sean.
Now that you're going or making go as Marky Basie as a, a solo artist, do you still plan on, on doing songwriting behind the scenes? Is that something that's been valuable enough to you that you, you want to continue it? Yeah, I'm, I'm always writing. Uh, we don't have as much time uh, to write for other people. And I guess now if I write something that I really like, I'm more inclined to keep it for myself. But I, uh, I do, I love writing for other people and trying to be in someone else's brain and, you know. Your new single, You and Me, is about uh, seeing an ex. Um, you said in the past that a uh, big motivation for you was that when you were living with Nick Knack, uh, you saw your ex starting to date a, a tabloid celebrity, and that really motivated <laughs> you to really go um, after songwriting. Uh, could you talk about uh, dealing with that and how that was a motivator? I just, um, living in like cutthroat LA, you get fueled by different things, and I guess uh, it's such a like dog fight there especially in my profession in entertainment. So we were broken up and I just kind of seeing like her kind of elevate her life and made me want to do the same, but it's probably not as big of a deal as, I don't know, it says on the note card or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, there is eight exclamation points on my note cards. <laughs> <laughs> you said that uh, your writing process often involves um, smoking a spliff and drinking some coffee beforehand or being a little bit less than sober. Uh, could you talk about uh, how you've kind of developed that process and how that's worked for you. Is this an intervention? Yeah, this is an intervention. <laughs> um, um, I'm not the real interviewer. They're gonna, <laughs> the therapist is going to pop up soon. Yikes. Um, yeah, I like to have a nice buzz going when I'm creating. I think it takes a few walls down. And I don't know. I just like the feeling of, like, I'm free in my mind and I'm not worried about anything. And a lot of times that comes, I don't like to overdo it, well, sometimes. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's fuel for me. So I love coffee. I'm addicted. Coffee's great. Yeah. Cheers for coffee. <laughs> nice. Um, you've talked in the past about getting signed at a very young age with your, your old band. Um, could you talk about now, uh, a few years later, sort of what you learned from that first initial experience making Go For It and now what you're doing differently? Yeah, Anything. the first, you know, I got signed, I moved to New York, and I got, like, a check for $10,000, and I, I thought, like, oh, my God, I'm so on. Like, You're rich. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was gone in, like, 20 days um, with nothing to show for it, just, uh, just a hungover young kid. But it was uh, when I first got signed, I really just, I'd never paid attention to how uh, political and how how business everything is, everything is, um, not just the music industry, but whatever you're doing. And I, I kind of just was coasting through it because I saw the business side as like anti-art. And now I look at the business side as like just a much, just as much a part of the artistic process as like the songwriting side. Cause it's all like, you can make it something that you love to do if you look at it that way. So that's how I look at it now, and I, I think I take more ownership of, uh, of my career now, and I work with really, really good people, so that makes it easier also. Yeah, you seem to surround yourself with um, kind of other California artists and, and close friends. Mm -hmm. um, is that important to you to just kind of keep that home base? Yeah, I think um, just being from the Bay Area, uh, it's really easy, and you know it's comfortable when you're around people that are kind of from your same culture and same background. and. Uh, yeah, I always, I always keep that around. You've said in the past that you, your goal in songwriting is trying to write songs that are going to last forever, or at least um, be holding up a few decades down the line, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, called out other singles that are kind of flash in the pan here one summer, and then you're not really listening to it the next summer. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about your um, way to go about that and sort of what you avoid to, to try to not have that flash in the pan song? I think I just, I don't want to make... Like, it's nothing, it's no shade against any type of song or whatever, but I just want to make songs that are personal to me. And as long as they're personal to me and I I, uh, I can kind of, like, feel myself, what I'm saying, then it's a good song. I don't uh, I don't try to be like, I'm going to be Stevie Wonder today or something like that, you know, because that's never going to happen. But I, uh, I, don't, I, th I just think, like, if you're making a song with the, like, intention of, oh, I have to make a hit right now, so I'm going to think of what's popping right now, what's the gimmick, let me look through Billboard magazine and see all the, like, song titles on the chart, and, oh, I should do this type of song now. It's just, it gets uh, boring, and that's the stuff that gets dated quickly, and um, 
Another thing I kind of learned too is like something that dates music is when your sounds are too typical of a time period. And for whatever reason, you know, like the Wurlitzer piano and the organ and the electric guitar and drums, they never go out of style. So my next, this Groovy People EP, I kind of tried really hard to use as much live instrumentation as possible because I think that's something that gives songs more life. You know, like we're in a trap time period right now and I love all that music too, but you know, in 15 years, everyone's gonna look at that like how we looked at early 2000s music right now or Chingy or something like that. Yeah, so just kind of avoiding that zeitgeist, not doing the YOLO is big right now and just trying to make it more personal to yourself. Yeah, exactly. A couple years ago, you had a bit of success with the song American Dream Life, and I believe you found out that Kanye West was playing that song over and over again. Could you talk about what that was like, sort of figuring that out or getting that, that <laughs> early recognition? That was never, like, verified, so I don't know. That, <laughs> Maybe he was listening no, to it over I and over did, again. Uh, that song did a lot for me. Just one of the main, like, kind of things that brought me to here, like, career-wise, was I have a, a manager named uh, G. Roberson, and he saw that song, and that's he was like, what is this? I need to talk to this guy. And that just kind of started this whole process, really. So it was like a, a catalyst for everything, American Dream Life. And we shot a video for it. How did Check you, it out. How did you go about shooting music videos so early on in the career? Before you got the big uh, record deal, obviously, it, it costs a lot to do. Uh, American Dream Life had a really good music video. Oh, thank just you. Just wondering how you pulled that together. You'd be surprised. In L.A., I'm sure it's the same in New York. You know, everyone has, like, a cousin who has a, a nice camera. And, you know, we, ha we have a crane, like, this crane I'm looking at right here. Like, just my friends, uh, everyone's in the industry, so you can just kind of pull favors. And I think, like, everyone's trying to get behind something that, is uh, passionate and everyone wants to believe in something and be part of a project. So I try to just use my uh, like my commitment to what I'm doing to inspire people. And uh, I think it works, especially for videos. We just shot a, a trailer that will be coming out for the EP that we actually use like crazy equipment, actually like damn near the same thing right here. Um, so that'll be coming out, but it's all just like pulling favors and being creative. I think in 2006, you were emailing back and forth with fellow California musician Kendrick Lamar before anyone really knew him outside of that area. Uh, could you talk about how that started and what you guys would talk about? As That was obviously a decade <laughs> nah, ago. Better beats. Um, no, he, had, he was K-Dot, and I was trying to like, just get beats off to like J-Rock and K-Dot and Glasses Malone. Like I was really just running around LA trying to do anything I could. And we kind of knew about this kid who was like supposedly gonna be the biggest rapper in the world. And we're like, whatever, nah, like, nah. And so I would send him beats and they would write back, like, I kind of like this one, I don't know. It ne nothing ever really happened, but it's been crazy to watch him turn into what he said he was gonna be. Have you gone back and reread those emails and like, oh my God, <laughs> what, what is this? No, I should do that though. Yeah, that would be crazy. <laughs> Um, a lot of the themes of your music touch on um, living in Hollywood and sort of the, the money and power of, of Hollywood. Uh, you've said in the past that um, you living in Hollywood, you feel a lot of the people there just sort of throw the morals out the window. Could you talk about um, how living there for so long has kind of shaped your music and what you want to pursue as an artist? Yeah, um, I feel like L.A. is the most competitive place in the world, and it's not, you can't really get by on just like your merit because it's so superficial. But I don't look at that as a bad thing necessarily. It's just an obstacle, you know? It's like, you can't be in LA and be like, okay, I have a degree from this place. Like New York is very like, oh, I went to this high school, I went to this college, now I'm gonna work at this advertising agency. Brag about your LinkedIn all the time. Or your yeah, like college. LinkedIn. Like no one in LA has a LinkedIn. I don't even know what that is. Uh, it's for the best, definitely. What? It's for the best you don't know what LinkedIn no, yeah. is. <laughs> no, yeah, but you know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's crazy to be there and just see like, oh, the most rich, successful person here is like a 18-year-old girl who didn't even get a degree or knows nothing probably about anything. Um, and that's just like a really daunting idea that uh, the only way to really make it is like figure it out. And there's not like a, a correct way to gain success. Um, but there's an opportunity there, like, to become successful there. In Hollywood, you have to really, like, dig inside yourself and kind of open up in a different way. 
And that's always inspired me. So even though everyone's always like, LA, I hate LA, so superficial, no one reads, everyone's a ditz, whatever, but it's all true. But at the same time, there's something like special about it that fascinates me and that's what I like to write about. A lot, a lot of great writers have been there and came out of there and have inspired me, so. Have you, <clears throat> have you had any aversion going on social media platforms it, going along with that thought that um, obviously the 18 year old uh, who's famous just from Instagram in, in LA, um, are, you, are you more focused on, I just want to release this track and ideally just put it out there or have you had any of that kind of question? No, I, I wish I could say that, like now to me writing music, this sounds crazy, but it's like almost, it's not secondary, but writing music, that's like for me, my personal thing. That's like something that is sacred to me that no one can shake that part of me, but the part that's like, that I'm more, that scares me more and excites me more is all the other, all that, all the social media stuff, being here, talking, and uh, traveling, and just trying to figure out what to do with this little musical gift that I have. Not gift, like, I made it, you know, gift for everyone else. Um, that's that's kind of, like, that's the, the mission now, and that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Is that how you said it? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Um, with the with your first band that obviously started around a decade ago and things were very different then, now you have things like Spotify and Tidal and obviously the Snapchat um, and Instagram. Can you talk about just how it's been different trying to break through this time around? I mean, this time, last time it was all about like you needed someone, someone else. And this time it's all on us. You know, we can make our own videos, post our own live performances, release music, everything really started for me on SoundCloud, you know, just posting free music. And I guess we had MySpace back in the day, but that was kind of, wasn't the same. Um, so it's it's really just, it's up to the artist now, which is really cool. And it makes it, you know, there, it's more diluted. Obviously, like, everyone, probably, like, half the people in this office have, like, their own songs that they put out, or, you know, like, anyone could do it. So you have to search harder for what inspires you and what you really like, but it's, I think it's cool that everyone could do it now, and it's really up to you. And just wrapping up before we go to audience questions, uh, I think one time you were in New York, you had a DMX kind of crash your dressing room, and just saw him last night too. You just saw him Crazy. last night. <laughs> could you talk about uh, what happened when he uh, you were hanging out the first time? I think he grabbed your guitar or something like that. He just walked in the dressing room. That's like one of my favorite. DMX was the biggest rapper in the world. I feel like people don't quite like remember, but. Uh, he walked in, he was like, I need to play that. Whose guitar is that? Like, I need to play that guitar. And I was like, yeah, it's mine. Like, you could play it. And he picked it up, and he pretended like he was about to start really going dumb. And, like, and he was kind of strumming really good in the beginning, and then everyone was, like, crowding around him, waiting for him. Like, is he really, like, playing guitar really well? But he was just kind of, like, banging on it and singing. But we sang uh, Bill Withers together, and then he kind of gave us, like, a motivational speech from the Drinking Hennessy. What did he say in the motivational speech? He said... He said, for your birthday, instead of uh, what he said, instead of you getting gifts, you should give a gift uh, to remind yourself that you got to live another year. You should give all your best friends a gift and all your family a gift instead of receiving them. And he said some other stuff, but that kind of stood out. It's inspirational words from DMX. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're going to open this up for audience questions now. Hi, Mark. Nice. <laughs> hi. <front>. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. It's been... Uh, really inspiring to hear your story and where you started off and where you are now. Um, so my question is, you know, if you're not writing music or using your AIM screen name to reach out to uh, your friends, what do you enjoy yes. doing uh, during your downtime? Um, I don't, I like to watch the Mindy Project <laughs> and uh, play basketball, chill. I don't know. It's been, I really am kind of obsessive about what, you know, what we're doing now in this project. So I, I'm always thinking about it and thinking about um, how we can just keep pushing. So it's not really too much downtime in my mind, but it definitely is nice to just be able to relax and read and hang out. It's, it's really like my life is so, it's really boring besides like the, the fun part, besides the music part. Hey, what's going on, bro? Congratulations up, bro? on the new single. Thank you. So my question is if you have any favorite artists to write a song for or a sing on, who would it be? Rihanna. So she's great. <laughs> it's a great choice. I think 
we have time for one more. Hi, thanks for being here. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so if you could travel, if you haven't already been there, perform, what city uh, would you perform? There's so many that I want to go to. I've really, I've only been outside the country like two times. I went to London one time, but I really want to go to Paris. Never been there. Heard it's beautiful. It's a great place. <laughs> Have you guys been there? Uh, my girlfriend was just there, but I wasn't there. Oh, I saw this night. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Very awful. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Sure, appreciate it. <laughs>